Here we go. Welcome to the Transform with Travel podcast, where we share stories of personal transformation and life lessons through our experiences of traveling and exploring the world. Travel is the ultimate accelerator for personal growth, and it can be the root catalyst for the pivots and plot twists we make in our lives. I'm your host, Kelly Tolliday, and it's my mission to inspire you to live life to its fullest, travel with an open mind and heart, and let the world show you a new perspective. I'm so grateful you're here with us today, so let's dive right in. Happy exploring. Welcome to the Transform with Travel podcast. I'm so excited to welcome Dr. Shivani Gupta here with us today. We're going to share so many amazing little nuggets of wisdom and and really dive into your story. Dr. Shivani Gupta is an Ayurvedic practitioner and an expert in fusing Eastern and Western practices that help our bodies achieve equilibrium. She completed her master's in Ayurvedic sciences and her PhD on turmeric, and her passion is teaching at-home remedies to reduce inflammation naturally that will help you enjoy more energy, less brain fog, less pain, and ultimately achieve vibrant health, which I think is something we're all striving for. (laughs) Dr. Shivani Gupta has practiced Ayurvedic medicine for over 20 years, and her approach is to show you the tools in your toolkit so you can reach for them every time you need them. She is also the founder of Fusionary Formulas, an Ayurvedic company that helps people with inflammation and pain. And I can say as a personal customer of Fusionary Formulas, you have transformed my sleep with your deep sleep tea. So I'm so excited for people to share and just learn more about you and be able to find these products. I'd love for you to just give a little background on, you know, what it, what it's like to have, having gone down this journey of an Ayurvedic path and how you even got involved in Ayurveda. Well, what is Ayurveda? Let's yeah. start with that. Yeah. <laughs> All the questions. <laughs> That's a great one, actually, because I always dive in and I never explain Ayurveda yeah. first. So Ayurveda is an entire system of medicine and health and healing from India that's over 5,000 years old. And what's really cool is it's this ancient system that had so much wisdom in it. It encompasses detox like protocols for us, mm. nutrition, gut health, brain health, circadian rhythm, self-care, how to eat, when to eat. So it's really a preventive lifestyle that we can all live every single day. And I truly believe that if we lived the Ayurvedic lifestyle, we would not see disease and chronic disease and inflammation and all these horrible things that we see happening in our populations at the rate that we're seeing them. So I'm just really passionate about teaching it because I think we should all live a life that's preventive. So we get to live as long as we want, as healthy as we want, and you know, be there for our families. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's a really big trend right now in people learning about longevity yeah. and not just how many years are in your life, but the quality of years that are in your life. And especially there's a recent documentary out about the blue zones, and that's all everyone's talking about now is longevity and what we can learn from these ancient traditions. And so how did you – get involved with Ayurveda? How did you become first aware that this was a lifestyle to follow? I'd love to hear about that. Sure. So I'm from Houston, Texas, and I grew up in a household right here in the West with an immigrant family where we were just trying to, like my parents were trying to just build financial foundation for us and survive. And I remember once we finally achieved some stability, we'd go back to India every year and I would hang out in my grandparents' homes, my mom's house and my dad's house, And my grandma, my mom's mom, anytime I had a stomach issue, any problem, she would just make like hinka pani. Like she would open the spice cabinet, the Indian spice cabinet, use some spices, make some teas and serve them to us. And I was was always so surprised that there's like two worlds. When I'm in Houston, we go to Eckerd's and we pick up what's there and it's like Pepto-Bismol. And when you go to India, there's this entire different toolkit that's stinkier, but also as effective. And so I just remember like two worlds, two worlds. My life was Western and Eastern. I was doing Indian classical dance and going to Sunday school at the temple every Sunday. But in school all week, it was just a different approach. And finally, by the time I hit high school, I realized I don't have the same body or immune system as anyone else. For some reason, everyone else gets to live a normal life. And I'm car sick, air sick, seasick. And if anyone sneezes, I go like I go down hard. And my pediatrician was giving me Augmentin every month mm. for those colds. She was like, oh, you're sick again. Oh, you're sick again. Obviously, we should go with a strong antibiotic. And at that time, there was less awareness around the punishments of high antibiotic use. And so I got to college, and I it became an even more acute issue. All my friends could party and have fun. And I was in college in Boston where it was cold, and I just I got so sick of being sick. Mm-hmm. And so finally, I was in India on one of our family trips – I was disastrously sick, and this Dr. Gupta handed me a prescription for this medication I needed. He he listed 12 medicines. And I looked at it, and I was like, you know what? No, I'm done. 
I'm done with living with whatever everyone else has told me works. Nothing is working. Mm. Something new has to work here. And there was just this moment where my intuition came out of me screaming. And my whole family looked at me like, you can't talk to a doctor that way. And I was like, watch me. And I was like, you haven't prescribed me one probiotic. You're about to blow my gut up for the 10th time with some crazy antibiotic out of India. Let's just, please, like, let's, let's have a conversation. I'm not doing any of this. And so that's when I went on this journey through India. I told my parents, I will open an Ayurvedic spa. I have to change my life. I know Ayurveda works. Like I just went on this exploration and everything I found healed me. And I have a gut that's like, I can't even tell you how strong my immune system is now. Mm. We just got through a pandemic and I'm like unscathed. I'm very impressed with if you like really honor the body, the power of the body to come back completely refreshed and anew. Yeah, absolutely. And so you mentioned that the antibiotic use destroyed your gut and in return it destroyed your immune system. Can you explain a little bit of the relationship between the gut and the immune system? Sure. So along in our gut lining, about 80% of our immune system is existing within our gut. So a lot of people think, oh, I have this immune system. Oh, and I have gut health. And, and we don't correlate it. Really, in Ayurveda, we teach that gut is the key to all. We teach that we have a digestive fire within us, and it's our job to honor that fire like a campfire. Mm. Like every day you wake that thing up, and you're going to use it to digest and metabolize your three meals. Your gut is your brain health. Your gut is your immune health. Mm. Your gut is your energy. Your gut is your metabolism. So everything you want in life from a longevity perspective or really just an immune perspective, it all comes down to gut health. And the problem is in modern day times, there's a million factors that want to destroy our gut. And so we have to really play defense to have a healthy gut and thus lifestyle. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's more and more of a turn, more and more of a trend of people understanding this. I'm even getting questions from our regular Western pediatrician asking about, is she on a probiotic? How's her, how's her nutrition? And yeah. trying to correlate that to all the colds that they get in daycare. So I think it's a really interesting turn of events that are happening right sure. now. And you're on the forefront of talking to a lot of different doctors and you're in doctor's offices all the time trying to get your amazing, amazing supplements and your courses out there so more people can live a vibrant life, which I absolutely love. You. When you talk about going from Houston to India and back and forth visiting family and going back, what do you think, besides the obvious of it just being vastly different culture, like it's, sure. it's a very intense culture shock when you're not used to it when you yeah. go there. But apart from that, with the attitude towards wellness on such a holistic uh, view with Ayurveda, what do you think are some of the biggest cultural differences when it when it comes to health in that capacity between the Western and the Eastern perspective? There's a lot there. There's huge contrasts. Mm. So growing up in the West, my parents were very hardworking, very successful entrepreneurs. They were the greatest combination of luck meets hard work. And so they went from having like $25 in their pocket to building a company worth tens of millions of dollars. But what that meant was we had a nanny. We had a housekeeper who was living. They would travel on business and just leave us home. We ate a lot of McDonald's and junk food. Mm -hmm. We were just those typical American kids. You have lots of activities. You're busy. Either your parents are picking up or someone's picking you up. You're eating fast food on the way home. And it's funny because I do that sometimes now. I'm like, okay, kids, order Chipotle, drive up, let's go. We have You have to eat in the car. So that like pace was here. Right. And then I'd go to India and none of the women, at least in our family, and especially back in the early 80s, worked. Women were stay-at-home moms. They were meant to manage and run the household. And so my grandma was always home. My aunts were always home. And there was this honoring. Like you would wake up and, you know, the temple where the gods are, God had already been, uh, you know, you'd already meditated in the morning. They had already done an offering to God. Then the preparation of food for the whole day had started. Proper fresh breakfast, proper fresh lunch made, proper fresh dinner made. Like such an honoring that food and nutrition for the family comes first. Mm. There's these vegetable valas, like these men who come down the street with their carts. They sell you your, your vegetables for the day. So everything was fresh daily. It's not like when I go to Publix and I buy my food and I'm hoping it lasts two weeks. Right, and I, exactly. And I Instacart my Costco, <laughs> you know, like it's a completely different vibe. Yeah. So that honoring of food, that honoring of sitting down as a family and eating 
people would wake up, not necessarily in my family, but in a lot of families to do their yoga. People in our family would wake up and go to the park nearby and walk and do their pranayama meditations. Mm. So there's a different understanding that health is, it's not an obligation, but it's like a requirement that you invest in your health daily versus here, it's more like I do my life and I hope I fit in my health or I'm trying to fit in my health versus there, the rhythm of life is just built differently. And so now, I mean, it's, you know, 30 years later since I went there as a child, it's different. It, I've watched India change and evolve and modernize and westernize. I watched fast food come in and MTV come in and all these things. But now you can see the revert, the return to Ayurveda, the return to yoga, the understanding that, hey, we signed up for all this and it was bad for us. Mm. So it's like a returning to wisdom. Yeah. And then, you know what? You can see over time those like s that cyclical energy of everything eventually always returning back to that ancient wisdom. And it's just a process of us remember or sorry, forgetting our way and then coming back to the remembering. Right. You mentioned how India really like the fabric of life. And this is a, a big generalization, obviously, and it depends on which village you're in or which city, but has that. That, that rhythm of life that incorporates health as part of their daily life, as, as, as a core part of their daily life, not just I'm going to slot in 30 minutes at a hit class and then boom, I've ticked off my health for the day, I'm done. And a lot of other places around the world that I've observed are like that as well. I know the Dutch have now been – the, in the Netherlands, they've been dubbed the the most fit or they get the most exercise in the whole world per week per person. And it's not because they're slogging it out for six hours a day at the gym. It's because they're riding their bicycles to work and their whole society has been built around making it cycle friendly. Sure. And so that kind of reminds me of like, OK, how can we slot in instead of slotting in wellness? We talked about this when I was on your podcast a few yes. months ago, baking in wellness to our life. Right. And so you mentioned with this rhythm of life and how the women are the managers of the household and food is a core staple of like an offering of love to their families through medicine, through the food. How have you found now that you're a mom of two and you went through your own pregnancy and postpartum experiences, how have you found that those postpartum, I guess maybe how have you found the pregnancy and the postpartum experiences different to that from America to India or how women are treated in that capacity? <laughs> What a loaded question. Yeah, right. <laughs> it is so different. When I chose to get pregnant with my children, I had already planned years ahead that I knew the year I was going to conceive, right when I was 30, I was ready to give up entrepreneurship for a period of time to focus on motherhood. I considered that its own honor and its own time period to be respected. I interviewed every Indian aunt and took notes like I was a PhD researcher. And I was like, I need to understand pregnancy because here in the West, what I see is everyone just gets pregnant accidentally, learns a few months in while they're still drinking that they're pregnant. And whatever health they have in the moment is their health. They're going to start, start taking some vitamins. And then they bust through pregnancy working as hard as they can. And then they go, boom, running into the hospital to have this birth, which might have some trauma involved. And I was like, all of that just sounds wrong. I want to have an organic, happy, healthy baby who is Zen. Mm. Because the way I looked at it, I was like, I get to live with you and you get to live with me for the rest of my life. So you're either going to be a torture device or you're going to be an amazing human. But I do have some control over which way you turn out. I don't have total control, but I knew I had some. So I interviewed everyone. I was doing my master's in Ayurvedic sciences at that time, right around the time I was ready to have kids. And I just remembered saying, I need to do a book. Like someone needs to write something on what an Ayurvedic pregnancy is. Mm. Like how do you fuse your dosha with circadian rhythm, with gut health, with prevention, with pregnancy? And so I wrote a book called The Conscious Pregnancy back then because it was just bursting out of me. But in India, we really look at pregnancy as everything the mother consumes goes to the baby. Mm. So what would you like your future child to be consuming? Is it horrible media content, horrible social media content, horror movies, negative things and negative emotions? Or do you want to hold her as like a goddess level of care and love her and feed her and nourish her? Like I remember every time I went to my mother-in-law's house, she'd be like, Shivani, here's food. I cooked it just for you. And I put ghee on top. And I'd be like, I don't want to gain weight. She's like, Shivani, it's ghee. It's Ayurvedic. Like, come on. I'm here to nourish you. You have to nourish yourself. Mm. That's the whole focus for this nine months. 
And so it's just vastly different. I, and the modern day woman, whether Indian or not, definitely treats herself like, all right, this is just a time period. I've just got to get through this time. And then at the end, I'll be getting this child. And I really look at it differently. I looked at it as, how do I produce the most Zen baby? And so now I have these two beautiful children. They are not perfect. And I'm by <laughs> far not a perfect mom. But I try so hard to just keep the space Zen focus on their nourishment and health. Like remember that the key pieces matter and all the little stuff doesn't. Mm, totally. And with, so I know in a lot of ancient cultures with postpartum, yes. there is this very sacred period of time post baby. Sometimes yes. it's 30 days, sometimes it's 40 days, sometimes it's even up to two months in some cultures. What does that look like from Indian culture to American culture? So that actually, after the idea of really honor this woman as everything she consumes will go to the baby and it'll impact her and her health, post-baby, we put a huge emphasis on. So according to Ayurveda and according to the Indian culture, the 40 to 42 days post-baby is the most important time for mother to heal properly so she doesn't have chronic long-term issues. And this is the time where baby is most sensitive and really honoring baby is important. So that's where I took the most notes from the aunties. I was like, okay, what do you feed mommy after baby? What do you mean non-gas producing foods? What are those super spices you're using? So they would recommend things like ajwain kapani. Ajwain is this spice that reduces gas in the body. Mm. And kapani just means made in the water, made in tea. So I would have ajwain in my tea. I'd have ajwain in these parantas and breads. There was a huge category of foods I wasn't allowed to eat, like cauliflower, or anything that would produce gas, mm -hmm. certainly no meat or outside food or processed food. Everything was homemade. My mom stayed with me for those 40 days. She flew in, even though she's an entrepreneur and she was busy. She's like, I'm taking these 40 days off to take care of you. And there's also like a Chinese medicine Ayurveda intersection there where we keep ourselves warm and like closeted. So I wasn't allowed outside the house. I was like in sweats and socks and a hoodie. Like they really want you to nurture yourself almost like the baby inside of you was mm. where you are held in the cocoon and the baby is held in a cocoon. And that's like the last piece to nurture and heal before you move on. So there's so much there culturally. Um, and that's why I wrote that book. And I honestly, I wish I wrote like deeper, further ones after that one. You can do a second edition. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's just so much there where, you know, I have friends who were like, well, you know, I had the baby four weeks ago. I'm done. I'm hitting the gym. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you are going to get joint pain for life. You may not put wind energy in your body. You may not exercise. I know it's tempting, but like let the body heal first so you get the long term health you want. Don't look, don't be short sighted. Yeah, I think. And even just from. From the physical point of view, just from your actual healing muscles, like the pelvic floor, oftentimes people get that six weeks. Okay, I'm off. I'm running. I, I have some friends that I know who were running at three or four weeks, and it's like, okay, you might feel great right now, but maybe at your second pregnancy or your third pregnancy, you might start feeling prolapse. You might start leaking. You might start doing all these things that we don't want those things happening down there. Right. Totally. <laughs> so it's like really thinking about the longevity, asking yourself, what does my 80-year-old self want to feel like? And is what I'm doing right now hurting her or hindering her? Exactly. And I think that's what Ayurveda, the science of life, is really all about, is how can I bring more quality into my life? So with Ayurveda, can you go a little bit into, you mentioned the word dosha. Can you go a little bit into like Ayurveda 101 in, in case people are interested and how do they learn more about it? Sure. So uh, doshas are a beautiful concept from Ayurveda. So taking the five elements that exist in nature, Ayurveda says that we each have our own individual bio, individual constitution. And so, for example, there's three of them, vata, pitta, and kapha. A vata person's more air and wind. So that's like your busy body, your thin and wiry person who's always on the go and can never settle down, mm -hmm. which is a lot of people I meet nowadays. Then you have the pitta woman or man. But a pitta person is fiery. They're like on fire, entrepreneurial, go-getters. They tend to get jealous and angry a lot, but they're more in the medium body or have a reddish tone to them even, which I'm a pitta. And then the kapha crew is like, big boned of the earth, stronger, they can lift heavier, they have curly, oily hair, they're very loyal, very good friends, they're kind of like mother nature, they hold that nature earth energy to them. And so these three constitutions are very interesting because we are born with our constitution, 
We can have different life traumas and events that shift our constitutions and lead us to being vitiated or imbalanced. And so my goal always is to sit down with someone, do a dosha quiz and understand what are you now? What were you before? And how do we bring you back into balance? Mm. Because post kids, I was a very guffa woman and I couldn't understand. I was like, how do I get my mojo back? Like, how do I feel like myself? I don't understand what's wrong with me. And when I finally just did the work, it took me over a year, but I brought myself back to my core initial dosha. All of a sudden, since then, I've been on fire. Mm. Like everything I create, I create with purity, alignment, and intention. Everything I want to do in the world works out now. Because I'm coming from this aligned place. My intuition is strong. My digestive fire and brain are on point. So like there's a lot of tools in Ayurveda's toolkits that you can use and customize to your dosha, including your own circadian rhythm, your own schedule. Your daily rhythm can be built on your dosha. And then you're that much more successful as a mom, as an entrepreneur, as a woman, as anyone out there who's trying to build a life that's of a higher caliber or a higher quality. Right. And it's almost like it's almost like not to be able to produce more, create more, but it's like how can I have more impact but with more ease? So it, it doesn't feel like you're constantly pushing up against a wall to get what you want, but it's just flowing to you because you're more in alignment energetically, physically, what you're supposed to be doing in this world. So that's really cool. And you mentioned circadian rhythm, which I know is something that you talk a lot about. You do a lot of workshops on. It's a big part of your course. You have a six-week course all about being able to bring in these Ayurvedic principles into your life and, and bring yourself into balance, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But as travelers, circadian rhythm oh is like the biggest problem that we face almost, sure. <laughs> especially as travelers with young babies as well, which that's a whole other topic. But yeah. how – can someone who's traveling internationally or even just traveling to a different time zone within the U.S. or within their own country, what are some of your best tips for someone as someone who travels a lot for work? Sure. What do you do to help keep your circadian rhythm on point? So circadian rhythm, let's backtrack a second. Yeah, what is it? <laughs> is this concept of chronobiology. It's basically saying that our cells know, live by a time schedule, and that time schedule is nature's schedule. So we can think that we can bypass nature and pull all-nighters and stay up late, but nature rules. We are born of nature, and we will be going back to nature. And so nature's rhythm is the seasons. It's the moon cycle. It's the daily sun rising and sun setting. Mm. And so if we learn how to live in our own circadian rhythm here and now in our own city, we have this new power where we're more energized when we can – leverage our energy during our certain times of day. And we have certain parts of the day which are just low energy time. We learn to rest in those. So for example, I am like poor, I have poor energy post lunch. It's my best time to do anything but focused work. I need high tea every afternoon. Then I'm supported going into the evening. So I have certain rules that if I follow them, I'm successful. Mm. And when I blow past all of them, I'm an exhausted mess. Mm. And I just laugh at myself and I'm like, would you like to do that tomorrow? No? Okay. So what I do to win at travel, because this last year has been nuts, I grew my company by a three X. I have been traveling to conferences and visiting factories and it's just been more travel than I'm used to. And it's definitely created this vata energy, this wind energy in me that I have to constantly battle with. And I'm like, Shivani, stay grounded. Come on, be in nature. But I hold my schedule no matter where I go. So I will always wake up, take a few moments to meditate. I will always have my morning tea at 7 o'clock in whatever city I'm in. Whatever is the strong rhythm I hold all day, I'll make a very conscious effort to hold it in that city. I'll wake up and work out. Just exercising on the same day you land anywhere mm. helps you with jet lag tremendously. Interesting. Anytime, anytime that you – I anytime. mean, obviously not super, super late at night, but let's say you land at 9 a.m. and you went for a workout at 12. That's yes. going to help you. Yes. Oh, I, interesting. I've read that scientifically it's proven that working out on the day you land is really beneficial. Interesting. So I always make sure I'm working out when I travel. I'm moving in nature when I travel. And I follow the rhythm of that city. So let's say I, I was just in Canada a month ago. They're three hours behind. I was like, oh gosh, three hours, that's a big time difference. So sleep with that schedule, adjust to that schedule. Don't push through and, and fight with the schedule. Yeah, like try to like hack your way yeah, through. don't have What would you say like on time. someone who is traveling, let's say to Europe, and you're sure. you're going overnight on a flight and you wake up and it's really like 1 a.m. your time, but sure. it's 6 a.m. over there. It happens a lot, especially in the summer. There's a lot of European travel. Uh, when this episode airs, it'll be over the holidays. So people will be traveling all over the world to see their family. Sure. 
what, what do you do for overnight flights or when you are, when you arrive somewhere, it's like a completely different time zone to where you are. I look at it as honor the body first. So let's say I'm going to Italy, which is my favorite place on earth next to India. And I go to Italy every other year because I'm just addicted. I'll make sure that I get as much sleep as I can. And I'll take whatever tools I need to. So whether it's Benadryl, I make a sleep formula. I'll take whatever I need to to get 10 hours of sleep on that flight. I want to show up where I'm going as rested as possible. I'm not trying to bust through and watch 10 movies and drink and party on this flight. Wherever you show up, if you're rested, you're that much more supported to go deal with whatever this time schedule is Mm. and adjust to it. Now, some people try to think real hard about, like, for example, when I go to India, it throws all of us off. Yeah. And so sleeping and not sleeping, you can try to play with. But to me, if I just get all the rest I need, I'm going to show up. Yes, when I land, I might be up too late for the first night. But then I'll quickly adjust it to the rhythm. Versus if you show up exhausted, you're not going to have the tools you need to stay up, stay, you know, all those adjustments you need to make. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I think that's that's super, super helpful. So you were saying – that you're more of a kapha person in your bio constitution, your dosha. And then when you travel, yep. it initiates a lot of vata energy. Sure. Yep. Can, and travel in itself, from my understanding, is very vata because travel is that moving and that wind and that, you know, yep. really restless, groundless feeling. Can you explain a little bit about when someone travels, if they're a kapha, if they're a pitta, if they're a vata, yeah. what they can do to kind of help themselves That's and true. alleviate some of that extra vata energy that they're feeling when they travel? Yeah, I think that's where dosha awareness can be very powerful for us. Because if you know your primary dosha, your travel can be customized seasonally and according to your dosha. So for example, I'm a born pitta. I hate being overheated. And so traveling, I finally caught this when I was pregnant with my second child. We went to this beach day on vacation. Our friends had said, we're going to spend the whole day at the beach. And I was like, okay. We go to this faraway place. There's no restaurants. There's no facilities. We're just on the beach. By the next day, I couldn't walk. I couldn't talk. And I couldn't function. I had to, like, take a day in bed. Oh, wow. And I thought, wow, that's an overblown pitta. Yeah. Okay. You blew way past your boundaries of what's okay. And since then, I will not go to beach vacation places. I just won't. Unless it's, like, a cold winter and we're trying to escape. But I live in Florida. There's nothing to escape. Yeah, you're, like, always in the heat. Yeah. So. <laughs> so what I do now is I very consciously direct every vacation to be near the mountains. Even if I'm going to Europe, let's go see some mountains. Let's go see some snow caps. Those are the things that nourish me and balance my core energy, especially in the summer. A pitta person is already fire. The summer is already hot. We should only go to cooling places because otherwise we will exacerbate what's in us. Mm. Guffa people should go to places that are more about movement and wind and energy, maybe a city with that energy because it's going to move the energy with them. It'll be more inspiring. It'll support them like getting their creative juices and their energy flowing. And the Vata people, they need more grounding too. So they should go to mountainous places. So you can really kind of customize based on the seasons where you tend to get imbalanced and annually. Just look at your year as what is going to keep me more grounded, present, centered? What are the places I can travel to that really support me? Like a lot of people went to Europe this summer. Yes. And this year was burning hot. And I was like, you know what? I'm so glad I couldn't go to Europe this summer. I would have I would have erupted out of my mind. Mm-hmm. That was the least supportive thing I could do to myself. And so I was booking a trip to Italy. My kids really want to go because they've heard me talk about it two billion times. And so we were trying to book a trip, and I kept saying October, November. Like, where can I go where it's just the beautiful amount of cold without being too cold? Because that's the way to enjoy it fully for my body type. Right. Yeah, and just being aware of, like, the way that you react to things. Like, you know, as as – having a, more of that pitta energy when you get overheated, when you get in those environments, you're going to erupt. You're going to have that anger. And so knowing how you react to certain ways, I feel that way. So from my understanding when I've spoken to different Ayurvedic practitioners is that I'm like a pitta vata. Like mm-hmm. I've got a lot of vata mental tendencies and a little bit in my hair, but then I've got the pitta fire. So – I like cannot do cities. Sure. I freak out in yeah. cities. It's too much for me. I'm already like way up in my head and the energy of the city just like takes me away. Mm-hmm. So I find the places that where the mountains meet the sea is like the perfect mix for me. Those are my happiest places in the whole world. Yeah. And apart from geographic locations that people can choose, how else can people support them? Maybe just as a whole, are you, from an Ayurvedic perspective, what can they take or how can they support themselves 
through food or what are some of the things from Ayurvedic perspective? What, what can they do to support themselves through travel? You know, I think it's about traveling with your toolkit. So when I travel, because I was trained so young that my immune system needs to be guarded, I travel with my supplements. I travel with my teas. I travel with a contingency plan that if I get the sniffles because something was on that plane or in that travel experience, I've got my battle plan ready just in case. Mm. And then additionally, I carry like all my sleep support, all the tea I need, everything. So my family laughs, but they're like, wow, there's the Shivani kit, all her tea, all her honey, everything came with her. You have like your own suitcase yeah. just for, I, <laughs> just I usually, for your supplements. Yeah, yeah, a lot of times when I travel, I just, that's the first thing that gets packed. I'm yeah. like, well, I could buy clothes, but I can't find my teas and supplements on the road. Exactly. So I have to go with all that. But that's part of my daily rhythm. And so it's part of my travel rhythm too. And that's what keeps me like on a track, on a rhythm that doesn't let travel throw me off course. Back in the day when my kids were littler, our friends would take us on these trips and I would just eat whatever and drink whatever. And our friends loved to drink. And I would come back and be like, what just happened? I feel horrible. I feel bloated. I feel not like myself. I feel like I have to detox now. And so now when I look at travel, I don't look at it as a free-for-all. I look at it as, okay, I'm going to travel. I'm going to love this. Breakfast has to be healthy and have protein. Lunch, dinner also has to have protein. Okay, I'm allowed to have alcohol and treats, but I'm a gluten-free vegetarian. I'm not breaking my gluten-free rule for travel. It's not worth it. But really looking at what you're eating, are you eating an anti-inflammatory diet? Are you eating a nutri nutritious diet when you travel? Not just saying, okay, well, I'm traveling, so now it's like fries and grilled cheese time. It's... It's keeping your daily rhythm when you travel, I think, is the best investment we can make mm. in our vibrant health that we keep all year, but that we also keep when we travel. I don't want to be traveling and get sick. So I do take my supplements daily. I have my teas at the exact same time. I use my sleep tools to ensure I get good sleep because oftentimes in hotels, I'm not going to sleep as well. Yeah. It's a different bed, different pillow, all the factors. And all the different sounds. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I make sure I have my deep sleep tea. I have my deep sleep formula on hand whatever it takes to ensure that I'll stay on rhythm. And then that ensures I'm going to have a better experience. Yeah. Cause you don't want to like wake up and feel like you're dragging either. Cause, and there's no, there's no such, there's, there's nothing wrong with having some drinks while you're away or totally. enjoying the pastry or the croissant or whatever, but it's like having those boundaries within it. And something that's always stuck with me is well, my naturopathic doctor in Sydney, she would always say, your body doesn't know it's on vacation. Your body is operating the exact same way that it's going to operate if you're at home. So if, like you said, if you're gluten-free vegetarian for 99% of yeah. your days back home and then you just go totally off script <laughs> and you lose the plot and you, you know, just eat all the things, your body's not going to know what just happened to it because it doesn't know it's on vacation. So I think that's a really good point for people to remember. And I think it goes back to a lot of ancient traditions and cultures and specifically in Ayurveda. It is so based on rhythms. And like your biggest piece of advice you just said was just try to stay within your rhythms Correct. and focus on your sleep. And if you take CBD or a sleep tea or whatever at sure. night to help you sleep, make sure you have that with you so that you can make sure that you're sleeping. Exactly. And and Ayurveda is very much about moderation. So like meeting in the middle. I, I love a great glass of wine. I love certain foods. I really love food in Italy. But it's like, okay, well, I love those things. I can really enjoy them then but in a rhythm and in a balance. And moderation's fine. You can go one way or the other, but just don't go whole hog off the ship and then cause troubles. Yeah, and so when you get home from your travels, and if you do say, okay, I drink a little bit more than I'm used to, I eat more pasta than I'm used to, mm -hmm. and you get home, what's your get back into my rhythm detox Ayurvedic strategy? Do you have specific practices that you do to help you get back grounded in, at home? I do, I do. Like I just was in Canada on a true vacation my mom had had this health crisis that came up and it scared me. And I was like, that's it. I'm taking mom on vacation, but we should go somewhere cooling because it's summer. <laughs> so we picked somewhere cool like Canada, Banff, Canada, which I love. And the minute I got back, I was like, well, that was a lot of indulgence. We went to a lot of fun restaurants and I definitely had a glass of wine or two. What's my plan? First thing, gut health. Gut health takes first priority above everything. So I brought in aloe vera juice in the morning and or ginger lemon tea. Mm. I was like, that's simple. It's it, I have that in my home, but bringing the habit back is hard because you just got back from vacation. You're not remembering all your habits. Yeah, so totally. I was like, okay, first let's just clean up the gut. If the gut's working, everything works. Then part two, I said, you have to drop into an anti-inflammatory diet, higher protein, homemade foods, no outside food for a week or two. 
and then cut down on the carbs and the sugar, like retrain the body that the vacation meals are not your daily meals. This is a homemade normal meal. And that's also a retraining when you get back from any trip. So I just immediately drop into an anti-inflammatory diet, fresh, more cooked foods, which is more Ayurvedic. Mm. But I do a good mix of fresh and raw as the salads alongside protein, less carbs and sugar. And that within a week or two, I'm back into my normal routine. And then I don't have to think about it. Yeah. And because especially with air travel, your gut goes haywire and your system is automatically in like a like fight or flight. Like what's happening to us? There's a lot of inflammation. And so, yeah, I can definitely see how that gut health can be number one priority for sure. Yeah. And go to yoga, exercise, whatever it is you do in your rhythm. I immediately go back to rhythm. And so because I, I get right back into my life schedule, there's no interruption. Mm. versus if I'm like, oh, I don't feel like going to the gym yet. I can't do that because I'll, I'll then give it a week of not getting into my rhythm. Yeah. Uh, so one of our past guests, Sean Spire, he's on episode five. He talks about it's OK, you know, seven, five days a week, six days a week. That's perfect. You don't need to be seven days a week on point every single time. And when you travel, it's OK if you take a little bit of a break of your routine. But when you get back home, yeah. Within day one, day two, day three, you have to get back because otherwise then that's when you go a week or sure. two weeks or three weeks and it, that's when it starts to become detrimental. It's not that week holiday that's truly detrimental. Yeah. It's when you don't get back into your rhythm of the things that make you feel really good. And with detox in particular, I know there's a couple Ayurvedic practices like tongue scraping yes. and and dry brushing. Can you talk a little bit about, about those that people can look into? For sure. I love Ayurvedic self-care rituals. As a mom, I kind of every once in a while have to go back and just do all of them just to reset myself, certainly after travel or anything like that. So we in Ayurveda recommend using a tongue scraper that's metal or copper, which is a metal, every single day Mm. in the morning and scraping the tongue 7 to 14 times to remove our toxic buildup and toxins that accumulate in the body because our tongue reflects every organ in the body. Mm. And so it's recommended for everyone. And a lot of times I do podcasts, and that's the one habit people pick up, which yep. makes me pretty happy. <laughs> well, like, everyone just picks up you a proper tongue scraper. You should just create your own tongue scraper yeah. and be like, here's my link, here's I my do. link. <laughs> I should. I'm ready to. I'll create like a luxury line of IRB. Oh, self-care let's do tools. it. Yeah. So tongue scraping is really important. And I t- travel with my tongue scraper because, of course, when you're traveling, you're going to eat more fun foods and mm. they're going to build- cause more buildup of toxins in the body. So there's that. We recommend oil pulling. Oil pulling is just taking like two tablespoons of any food grade organic oil, coconut oil, sesame oil, putting it in the mouth, holding it five to 20 minutes, and then spitting it out in the trash, not the sink, not the shower, not in any pipes. So that one will take all the oral microbiome that you have and every bacteria and thing that's not good in there, collect it, and send it out. Mm. I don't do that one when I travel, although now there are travel packets I've seen for coconut oh, oil. Oh, okay. They're sold at Whole Foods. I was like, good job, guys. You're very smart. But I do oil pulling at home, and that's a great way to detox after any trip. It'll pull toxins out of the body as well. We also love dry brushing. So dry brushing is any plant-based fibrous brush and brushing from the bottom of the feet up towards the neck. And that's really going to move the lymphatic system. Mm. It's a great self-care tool before bed because at bedtime we're going to detox. So it'll tee you up for a more effective detoxing at bedtime. But you can dry brush on vacation if you want or you can just dry brush when you get back. Then we recommend something called a pyung massage. A pyung is really great probably post-travel now that I say it. A pyung is massaging the self with any food-grade organic oil, starting again from the feet. So I'll usually put a towel down and do both of these. But, or, you know, you can use coconut oil. Sesame oil is the king of oils Mm. in Ayurveda because it has vitamin E. It's antibacterial. It's very beneficial. So if you want that, like, luxe, beautiful, supple skin for life, sesame Sesame oil oil is is the go-to. And you can also put it in your hair. So if you're having hair loss or hair graying, a head oil massage is what we do in our ancient Indian traditions. But a pyung massage is very grounding. And so in this last couple weeks of my life, it felt very vata imbalanced. And I was like, you just got to, you have to use the whole toolkit. So I did all these things in the evening. And then I'll usually do an Epsom salt bath after, then get in bed. And I'm like, okay. I Life. feel like ready to sleep just just hearing about all yeah. this. It sounds you, amazing. You have this like profound sleep. You feel like all is well in the world. And then Even, have your deep sleep tea before, yes. yep. boom, you're and done. You're done and you get this amazing sleep. Like my goal right now because of how busy life is, I just want to wake up 
like refreshed and happy and feeling like life's epic. And I have been achieving that. I'm using all my tools, but I'm getting this perfect sleep right now. And then I'm when I wake up, I'm like, yes, let's gym. Yes, let's yoga. Yes, let's work. And I want to feel like that every day. So that's yeah. why I use all the Ayurvedic tools because it's a whole different quality of life mentally, emotionally, and physically when you do those things. Yeah, totally. Because like we said, it's it's not like Ayurveda is, is – allowing yourself to get the quality of the longevity of your life. Right. You can have a hundred years, but if every day you're waking up feeling like, oh, another day in the slog, I got to get back up. I can't open my eyes. I need three cups of coffee. Like that, what's the quality of that, right? We want to feel energized and and grateful and happy and just like so ready to take on the day. And when an opportunity comes, you want to be able to take it full throttle and, sure. and go for that. And you need to be able to bring these practices into your life so that you can, can, get, can get that balance. Yeah. And so it sounds like with all of these practices that you do and but also enjoying the world so much, like it seems like you've had such a vast array of travel experiences and that you really do allow yourself to indulge in all of the experiences that life and this world can offer. Where have been like some of your favorite places? I know you mentioned Italy, so I don't know if that's going to be number one. <laughs> but can you talk a little bit about like your favorite travel experiences that you have or what you love so much about travel? Yeah, you know, growing up, what's great is my parents knew that we were going to see our family in India every year or every other year, but they also made this conscious decision that they could show us the whole world, but why not show us India? And so India, the north and the south, the east and the west are vastly different. Mm -hmm. The languages are different. The cultures are different. So we made it a conscious effort that every time we went to India, we would see some other part of India. So I've seen the southernmost point. I've seen Bombay, Calcutta, all the places, the mountains. And so my favorite place to travel on earth is actually India. I would go there every year or twice a year if I could. Right now I have little young kids, but when they're older, I'll be traveling more. And I'm a Sagittarius, so I just love leaving and running around anywhere and exploring new places. But India, I think, is just so fascinating. The food is so cool. The, the experiences are so beautiful. I love the richness, the textures, obviously. Mm. And I'm Indian. I love the clothing and the shopping and all the things. Then after India is Italy, because I studied abroad in Italy in college. Oh, okay. Where in Italy? I lived in Siena for three weeks and Florence for the oh, rest wow. of the semester. And my parents visited me at Thanksgiving, and I was like, Mom and Dad, I have this idea. I think you should leave me here, and I'll just come back in the next year after summer. They were like, we are not leaving you <laughs> in Italy. Because so I just wanted to be a photographer who got to like do yoga and roam in the mountains and be a yogi photographer. I mean, sounds like a dream. That's all I wanted, and they knew it. So they were like, we cannot let this one off on Tulu a leash. We need to bring her back, make her focus on business and be successful. So those are my two favorites. But honestly, I'm one of those just, I'm like a kid. I just want to see a new place. My dad used to make so much fun of me. He'd say, Shvani, it doesn't matter where I take you in the world. You always say, I want to live here. This is it. He's like, you, we've taken you to France. We've taken you to Malaysia, Singapore. It doesn't matter. You just get so excited. So I'm like one of those childlike people. You can yeah. take me anywhere as long as it's comfortable. I don't like to rough it. Not too it. hot. I don't want to. Not too hot. Not too hot. <laughs> and I don't like to rough it anymore at like too rough a level. Um, but as long as I get fed, I'm happy. And I just want to like see anything new in the world. Yeah. I, I I'm like the exact same way. Yeah. Whenever I go somewhere new, I'm like secretly looking up long-term rentals. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, how can I live here longer? Yeah. We went to Costa Rica. I was like, babe, I think we should have a house in Costa Rica. Oh He's my like, God. We're the same. Stop it, Shivani. I'm like, no, but the food nowadays, I really look at it as like quality of food. Yes. If I can live in a place that's going to feed us nurturing, organic, healthy food on the right seasons, like You've got me sold. Like, I want to live in those places. Yeah, and I think I, I really do appreciate what you say about India because I, I, I spent five weeks mainly in the north, so I spent a lot of time in Rajasthan mostly, yes. and then we were up in Rishikesh and Varanasi, and and we spent some time in New Delhi, which I surprisingly really loved. Yeah. I was not expecting to love it, but I did. And it is just such, like, the, the richness, and I think it's just – so overwhelming with the senses that you are forced to be so present. Yeah. Like if you take your eye off the ball for one second, you don't even know where yeah. you are. You'll get run over. <laughs> exactly. You know? And I'm from Delhi. That's where my family's from. And Rajasthan is stunning. Mm. And Rishikesh like has this Ayurvedic spa that I was just like, I just want to live here for the rest of my life. So yeah. yeah, there's just so much to the world. And I think sometimes we think we can't travel. I, I'm one of those people. I'm always like, oh, there's too much work. Oh, it's the school year. Oh, budget. Oh, all the things. But every time I finally leave, I'm like, why don't we do this more often? Like, this is when I'm most creative. Like, when I was in Canada just now, I started writing my next book. Then I got back, and I've got no creative flow. Exactly. So it's like the most inspired places in the world can transform 
our entire life experience. And that's why I love what you do with the retreats. I'm like, yes, of course we should go on wellness retreats that completely change our life experience and and our outlooks. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Come on retreat with us. Yes, I will. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I agree. I remember I, I tell this story a lot, but I, I remember sitting in this like three story bunk bed on a train in Vietnam and it's like an overnight train. And I have this notebook and we were, we were traveling for like a year and I had this notebook and it was just business ideas after business ideas. And Sam and I were like, what if we patent this? What if we create this? What about this website? And it's a, it doesn't actually have to come to fruition. It's allowing yourself to be in that, like you said, childlike wonder and yeah. just be in the awe and the inspiration. And, and that has its healing benefits as well too, allowing your brain that just mental reset of not having to be so in it all the time. Yeah. Do you think... Uh, this is me just going completely off the cuff, but do you think your like tendency to be like, no, I have to, I have to stay at home and I have to work. Do you think that's your kapha or your pitta energy of being like wanting to be at home is your kapha and your pitta is being like, but I got to keep working. I got to keep working and you need more vata. Like yeah. get out there and explore. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's funny. I think we have these, like, there's so many factors, right? I'm an introvert naturally by like birth but I've learned to be an ambivert because that's what supports me in business. I am a pitta and I'm a Sagittarius. And by human design, I'm a projector. Okay. So it's like a funny combination of like I need a lot of self-care nurturing. I want to be at home because it's comfortable and it's simpler and it's easier. But I want to leave and run around the world and see it. But then I want to return back home. So it's like this yeah. these funny juxtapositions that exist. I know that I'm healthiest at home. Because when I do travel, I do like loosen the leash a bit on my health. And I'm one of those body types where I, based on my genetics, but also based on just who I am, I have to like watch my health. Mm. It's one of my jobs. So I watch my health first. I manage my family and life second. I work third. So because I have my priority list, I, I do hold a tight schedule when I travel because I want to maintain my health. But... I don't know. I just, it's like this funny juxtaposition. Yeah, you're like three or four people in one. <laughs> exactly. I really do feel that way. I, I, like this week, I was like, you know, we've just been living in the school routine. It's only been a month. But the school routine is dragging me down. So I'm like, we need to go on a trip. And they're like, Shawnee, stop. Like, do the work. Come on, just stay focused. Yeah. Well, yeah, and you know what is is interesting? Also, in the podcast episode I mentioned with Sean Spire, episode five, he talks about, you know, doing – doing the work at home, right? Like if you're on it 80% of the time, 90% of the time, then it's okay to have those fun yeah. gallivants and those fun indulgences and and go. And it's just, just making sure you're staying within the parameters of those boundaries of health, which Ayurveda is so beautiful because, I mean, we've known each other now for four years, 2019, we met down in Zen Mindspace, down in Fort Lauderdale, and you yeah. were doing Ayurvedic workshops and consultations and we started getting into contact and, and I was learning a lot from you at the time and especially on your Instagram you share so much information and from what I gather from you is Ayurveda is just such a beautiful sustainable health philosophy life philosophy it's not rigid it's not you can't eat this and you can't do that it's it's a practice of moderation to fit into your life to help you amplify your wellness and you can take it as far as you want to take it sure. and you can take it as little as you want to take it and I think that's so beautiful when things aren't so rigid because our life is just a constant flux of ups and downs and ebbs and flows and high True. stress and low stress mainly True. just high stress with young yeah. kids <laughs> And, and the thing is, you know, my memories from my childhood that are my best memories is when we traveled. Mm. And so I really do think of that. My father passed away when I was about 23. And when I looked back, I remembered Hawaii. I remembered India. I remembered Boston. I remembered New York. Like I could remember all these trips we had. I didn't really remember the day to day. And so even though I'm so focused on like health and schedule and rhythm and all these things, I have this awareness of the time when we let all our guards down and are super present to our family is usually when we leave. Mm. Because the level of responsibility that at least me and my husband carry on a daily basis with the family we're moving with and living with, it's just a lot. And so even this week, I was like, you know, let's just go to the JW Marriott Turnberry. It's down the road. It has a water park. It would bring a day of just pure joy. And I think that that has the most tremendous value when it comes to our health and our well-being because it's just that letting go of everything to just be together. Mm. You're going to eat fun stuff. You're going to do fun stuff. Who cares? At least you've got to create those core memories, those magical memories. That's what I call them. I want those magical memories with my kids 
not the mommy got us through the week and activities, yeah. which is my daily life. And they'll appreciate that when they're older. Like I look back and, and I, I, with such deep respect to my mom about the day in, day out, every meal, every soccer practice. But as you said, it's those really novel, new, like, out of out of your routine experiences that stand out most in your timeline. So as an adult, I can 100% appreciate everything that my mom did for me and, and my dad as well. And also, I remember very vividly yeah. being in Colorado with our family, going on this cruise, doing all these, you know, going camping. And, you know, so it's, it's a, a way to blend both of them together. And I think that's what Ayurveda does really well is allowing yourself to blend your life the way that you want to amplify your health. Exactly. So I so appreciate you being here today, I'm going to give all the time in the world at the end of this so you can share all the things because I do think – I actually, back it up. I want to hear about your six-week Ayurvedic course, online online program that you have because yeah. I think it's such a good launching point for people that hear all this and they're like, this sounds amazing. Yeah. I'm in. Check me off. How do I just even start? Because it can sure. be a little overwhelming at the start. So how one, how would you say – people start yeah. looking into this? And two, how can they get involved with your program? Sure. So a good starting off point is my dosha quiz. On my website, I put up a free dosha quiz just so you can kind of understand your personality type. And people usually get that answer and they're like, wow, I feel so seen. And they'll message me on Instagram. They're like, I'm a pitta. You were right. So it's just, it's good to start stepping into what Ayurveda is. And my website, shvanigupta.com has the dosha quiz and it has a lot of other videos on everything we just talked about. And then in 2020, I created a six-week program because after doing so many Ayurveda consultations, what I learned was no matter what your health issue is, Ayurveda has a lifestyle protocol that we can all live that will help if you have an autoimmune condition, if you're inflamed, if you have a disease you're struggling with that's based in inflammation or any sort of chronic disease pattern, fixing the gut, fixing sleep, adjusting diet, using super spices and your medicine cabinet, all the things I teach regularly – when you learn it at a deep level, it becomes part of you. And so that's why I created the six-week program. And after a lot of women take, took it, they said, Shivani, I feel like I have a Shivani on my shoulder. And this, your voice comes through and tells me, do more self-care. It's time for tea. Yep. Put down that Netflix or TV and take care of yourself and nourish yourself. And that's really my message that I'm trying to show everyone how to do using life, the Ayurvedic lifestyle. So that's a six-week program that I teach. It's a live program, so I want everyone to go through the modules and I get on a group call with them so I can answer all the questions. And then I also support them with supplements and teas because turmeric and spices have so much power in our health. And so if we can reach in the toolkit to get the quick solutions but learn the long-term sustainable solutions, then I think we've got the best of both worlds. So the six-week program is FusionaryMethod.com. My website's ShivaniGupta.com. And then, like you said, I teach a lot on Instagram because I love it. So it's at Gupta. Awesome. And what's what seems cool about the program is that you, you get involved in a Facebook group yes. and you get to meet all these other people that are also on the journey with you. So it's also that, like, community accountability support, too. So I'll link all of these, all the places, all the things for people to connect with you. But I, I end every episode with four rapid-fire travel pop quiz questions. Awesome. So I'm excited to see what you have to say. So. Number one is if you could only go back to one country or place, town, whatever it is in the world, where would it be and why? Oh, my God. Positano, Italy. <laughs> I'm obsessed. I think it's the most beautiful place. I was just there two years ago. It's just magic. You know, it's one of those cities that holds magic. Mm. And the food's amazing and the people are amazing. And I think Italy teaches us how to live this much more relaxed lifestyle where we appreciate life as opposed to just busting through life. Yeah, that's slow living for sure. Okay, number two is what's number one on your bucket list right now? Mm, Bali. Ooh, you I haven't been. No. Oh, yeah, you're going to love it. I want to go so bad. <laughs> you're going to love like, it. life bucket list to oh, go. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I actually just did an interview with uh, yoga teacher Nikki Nee. Okay. She – did her yoga teacher training in Bali at the same studio that I was going to and I was living in Bali and we were just talking about the the sacredness of every day and that they do offerings in front of their house every day and the incense and just the, oh just such a magical magical place so when are you gonna go I don't know <laughs> it's on my list I have no idea all right we'll make it happen we're just gonna speak it out into the okay. universe there please all right number three what's the biggest life lesson you've learned while traveling oh 
my goodness. I think it's in India that life is short and we really think we've got forever. Growing up, I'd go to India and someone would pass away of a health disease related to diabetes every time I went. Mm. and that Like really, a family member. A family member. Mm. And it really shaped me because it was like in my high school years. And I was like, what is wrong with my family? I already know I have a not great body and immune system. So it really just reminded me in India, like – there's so many people. It moves so fast. Mm -hmm. you, you never know. And someone's like gotten run over by a bus. And like there's just such a rapidness to life there that I just I always get there and I'm like, gosh, we should just appreciate each day. So, yeah. Yeah, totally. And I also think there's just such I mean, I'm not from India, but after spending time in Varanasi, which is where they they honor the dead by walking them through the streets and putting them on the yeah. stretchers Fires. and then the fire yeah. and, and they and into the river. It's such a. It's just in your face. Death yes. is in your face all the time. I know. Whether it's an animal or a person or something, yeah. like it's in your face. And it is very, uh, for something like a society as in America, we shy away from death so much. Someone passes away and it's, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I'm sorry for your loss. And then you see them a couple months later and you think, oh, they have to be better now. They're not grieving anymore. Sure. Bye. Whereas in India, it's very much like a spiritual practice of yes. honoring the dead and and yeah. being very open and yeah. okay with sitting with death. Yeah. I remember there was a tree in Varanasi and the Bodhi tree maybe. Mm -hmm. I can't remember. There's a specific tree in Varanasi where older people who feel like they're going to be passing soon, they travel from all over India and sit under the tree so that they can pass away under this sacred tree. Wow. And we just walking around, we're we're looking at everyone and it's just like such a part of the culture. Would you yeah. say that? Yeah, it's very much a part of the culture because it's part of our spiritual study. Like mm. Hinduism and Buddhism are intertwined. And, you know, I just had a, a big death in my family. And our understanding, we're still going through it, but our understanding is, you know, when you live your life, like I'm in my 40s, so you have these quarters of your life. You're born, you study, you work, you build, you work, you build, and then all of a sudden you retire. And that last quarter, we believe you're meant to like let go of all attachments, release all karmas, let go of everything you're attached to so you can become one with God. And so this person in my life who passed, I truly believe that he had already given everything up and he achieved oneness with God. Mm. And so that's what you're talking about is that honoring of like, okay, my last phase is meant to be beautiful and peaceful. I'm meant to serve. And everyone has different philosophical approaches to that. But in India, very much it's just part of your life. And, and you are raised in a multi-layer household with your elders, with the grandchildren all together. So it's just a different approach. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know how to explain it. It's like our culture is just so different that – it's 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 beautiful in its own ways, and it's also tough because you're very intertwined. Yeah, definitely. So number four, the last one, is if you could give a piece of advice to someone who's just starting out in their travel journey or just maybe has a little bit of fear or anxiety around it, what would you, what would you say to them? I would say that our travel experiences are probably the biggest ones that are going to shape us in this life. They're the ones that push us. We're going to push our boundaries. We're going to experience a lot of change. We're going to experience new foods, new smells, new sights, all those things. And so just be open to it, but also carry your little security blankets that make you feel at home. Nowadays, my mom will travel with her chutneys and pickles because if the food doesn't taste good, she can fix anything with that. That's she, awesome. She can have that on bread and feel like she's at home. And so whatever makes you feel home, just carry it with you. It's not a big deal. Check in that luggage. That's what I do. And, and keep that bit of home with you so you feel you're in your rhythm and you're comforted mm. as you're exploring the new world. I love that. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so, so much. I will definitely, I'm going to link everything in the show notes so that everyone can connect with you. And I highly encourage all of our listeners to look at Fusionary Formulas for all of your amazing supplements, all your amazing teas. If you're interested in diving deep with Ayurveda, I would highly recommend her six-week program. And just connect and say hi. And yeah. I just thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Transform with Travel podcast. Don't forget to hit subscribe so you never miss an episode of inspiration, adventure, and exploration. If you felt inspired by this episode, please rate and review in whatever streaming app you're listening from. This allows us to spread the word even more and continue to serve up weekly doses of adventure. As always, we'd love if you could share the episode with someone in your life who you think will benefit from this conversation. Thanks so much for listening. This is your reminder to get out there and keep on exploring.